The Last Adventure by Melville Davison Post. The talk had run on treasure. I could not sleep, and my friends had dropped in. I had the big south room on the second floor of the Hotel Paris. It looks down on the casino in the Mediterranean. Perhaps you know it. Queer friends, you'd say. Every man jack of them a gambler. But when one begins to sit all night with his eyes open, the devil's a friend. Barclay was standing before the fire. The others had drifted out. He's a big man, pitted with the smallpox. He made a gesture, flinging out his hand toward the door. That bunch thinks there's a curse on treasure, Sir Henry. That's one of the oldest notions in the world. It's unlucky. But I know where there's treasure that's not unlucky. At least it was not unlucky for poor Charlie Tavor. He did not get it, but there was no curse on it that reached to him. It helped poor Charlie finish in style. He died like a lord in a big country house, with a formal garden and a line of lackeys. Barclay paused. Queer chap, Tavor. He was the best all-round explorer in the world. I bar nobody. Charlie Tavor could take a nigger and cross the poisonous plateau southwest of the Libyan desert. I've backed him, I know, but he had no business sense. Anybody could fool him. He found the stock of bar silver on the west face of the Andes that made old Newt Hardman a quarter of a million dollars. Clear, after the cursed beast had split it a half-dozen ways with a crooked South American government. Barclay's teeth set, and he jerked up his clenched hand. It's a damn steal, Sir Henry, a piece of low-down, dirty robbery, and it was like taking candy away from a child. Sign here, Mr. Tavor, and Charlie would scroll on his fist. Some people think there's no hell, but what's God Almighty going to do with old Newt? He flung out his hand again. Still, the thing didn't dent Charlie. He never missed a step. Don't bother, Barclay, old man, he'd say. I'll find something else. And then he'd go off into this dream he had of coming back when he'd struck it to the old home country in England, and laying it over the bunch that had called him no good. He's never talked much, but I gather from odds and ends that he was the black sheep in a pretty smart flock. Then I'd stake him out to a cheap outfit. Not much. I've said he could push through the Libyan desert with a nigger, and he'd drop out of the world. It wasn't charity. I got my money's worth. The clay pots he brought me from Yucatan would sell any day for more cash than I ever advanced him. Barclay moved a little before the fire. I was listening in a big chair, my feet extended towards the hearth, a smoking jacket had replaced my dinner coat. It was five years ago, in London, Barclay went on, that I fitted Charlie out for his last adventure. He wanted to land in the Gulf of Pei Chai Li and go into the great desert of the Shamo in central Mongolia. You'll find the Shamo all dotted out on the map, but it's faked dope. No white man knows anything about the Shamo. It's a trick to lay off these great waste areas and call them elevated plateaus or sunken plateaus. You can't go by the atlas. Where's Kane's open polar sea in Morris K. Jessup's land? Still, Charlie thought the Shamo might be a low plain, and he thought he might find something in it. You see, the great gold caravans used to cross it 3,000 years ago, and as Charlie kept saying, what's time in the Shamo? Well, I bought him a kit of stuff, and he took a P and O through the Suez. I got a long letter from Peking two months later, and then Charlie Tavor dropped out of the world. I went back to America. No word ever came from Charlie. I thought he was dead. I suppose a white man's life is about the cheapest thing there is northwest of the Yellow River, and Charlie never had an escort. A coolie and an old service pistol would about foot up his defenses. And there's every ghastly disease in Mongolia. Still, some word always came from Tavor inside of a year. A tramp around the horn would bring in a dirty note, written God knows where, and carried out to the ship by a naked native swimming with a thing in his teeth, or some little embassy would send it to me in a big official envelope stamped with enough red wax to make a saint's candle. But the luck failed this time. A year ran on, then two, then three, and I passed Charlie up. He'd surely gone west. Barclay paused, thrust his hands into the pockets of his dinner jacket, and looked down at me. One night in New York I got a call from the city hospital. The telephone message came in about ten o'clock. I was in Albany. I found the message when I got back the following morning, and I went over to the hospital. 
The matron said that they had picked up a man on the North River docks in an epileptic fit, and the only name they could find on him was my New York address. They thought he was going to die. He was cold and stiff for hours, and they had undertaken to reach me in order to identify him. But he did not die. He was up this morning, and she would bring him in. Barclay paused again. She brought in Charlie Tavor, and I nearly screamed when I saw the man. He was dressed in one of these cheap hand-me-downs the Germans used to sell in the tropics for a pound, three and six. His eyes looked as dead as glass, and he was as white as plaster. How the man managed to keep on his feet, I don't know. I didn't stop for an explanation. I got Tavor into a taxi and over to my apartment. Barclay moved in his position before the fire. But on the way over, a thing happened that some little god played in for a joke. There was a block just where 33rd crosses into 5th Avenue, and our taxi pulled up by a limousine. Barclay suddenly thrust out his big pockmarked face. The thing couldn't have happened by itself. Some burlesque angel put it over when the old man wasn't looking. Spread out on the tapestry cushions of that limousine was Newt Hardman. There they were side by side, not six feet apart. Old Newt in a sable-lined coat, and Charlie in his hand-me-down at a pound three and six. The muscles in Barclay's big jaw tightened. Maybe there is a joker that runs the world, and maybe the devil runs it. Anyhow, it's a queer system. Here was Charlie Tavor, straight as a string, down and out, and here was Newt Hardman, so crooked that a fly couldn't light on him and stand level, with everything that money could buy. I cast it up while the taxi stood there beside the car. Newt was counsel in a South American port that you couldn't spell, couldn't find on a map. He didn't have two dollars to rub together until Charlie Tavor turned up. There he sat, out of the world, forgotten, growing moss and getting ready to rot, and God Almighty, or the devil, or whatever it is, steered Charlie Tavor into him with a bar of silver. He picked Charlie to the bone and cut for the States, and this damned crooked luck went right along with him. He was in a big apartment now, up on Fifth Avenue, and four flushing toward every point of the compass. His last stunt was patron of science. He'd gotten into the Geographical Society, and he was laying lines for the Royal Society in London. He had a Harvard Don working over in the Metropolitan Library, building him a thesis. The thing made me ugly. I wanted to have a plain talk with the devil. He wasn't playing fair. Old Newt couldn't have been worth the whole run of us. I've legged some myself, and I had a right to be heard. The devil ought to make old Newt split up with Charlie. True, Charlie belonged on the other camp, but I didn't. And if I wanted a little favor, I felt that the devil ought to come across with it. I put it to him, or down to him, as you'd say, while I sat there in that taxi. There was a grim energy in Barclay's face. He was no ordinary person. I got Tavor up to my apartment, and a goblet of brandy in him. I never saw anybody look like Tavor as he sat there propped up in the chair, with a lot of cushions around him. It was winter and cold. He had no clothes to speak of, but he did not seem to notice either the cold outside or the heat in the apartment, as though somehow he couldn't tell the difference. And he was the strangest color that any human being ever was in the world. I've said that he looked like plaster, and he did look like it, but he looked like a plaster man with a thin coat of tan-colored paint on him. Barclay paused. It's hardly a wonder that no message reached me. The devil couldn't have got word out of the hell land he'd been in. Lost is no name for it. He'd been all over the Shamo, and the big Sahara is a park to it. He'd been north to the Kangai, where they used to get the gold all the caravans carried across the Shamo, and he followed the old trail south to the Great Wall. It's all a Satan's country. I don't know why God Almighty wanted to make a hellhole like the Shamo. He paused, then he went on. But it wasn't in the Shamo that Tavar got track of the thing he was after. He said that the age he was trying to get back into was much more remote than he imagined. It must have been a good many thousands of years ago. He couldn't tell, long before anything like dependable history at any rate. There must have been an immense age of great oriental splendor in the south of Asia and along the East African coast, dying out about the time our knowledge of human history begins. Barclay went on, unmoving before the fire. I don't know why we imagine that the legends of a little tribe in Syria running back to the 5th or 6th century begins the world. Anyway, Tavar got the notion, 
as I have said, of an age in decay at about the time these legends start in, with the trade moving west. He nosed it all out. God knows how. Of course it was only a theory, only a notion, in fact. He hadn't anything to go on that I could see. But after two years drifting about in the shamo, this is how he finally figured it. Northern Asia traded gold in the west. The mine product would be molded into bricks in lower Mongolia. It was then carried overland to the southwest coast of Arabia. There was some great center of world commerce low down on the Red Sea about 800 miles south of Port Said. Tavor said that when he began to think about the thing, the caravan route was pretty clear to him. Arabia seemed to have been connected in that remote age with Persia at the Strait of Ormus, so there was a direct overland route. That put another notion into Tavor's head. These treasure caravans must have crossed the immense sandy desert of El Kali, and this notion developed another. If one were seeking the wreck of any one of these treasure caravans, he would be more likely to find it in the El Kali than in the Shamo. Barclay moved away from the fire, got a chair and sat down. He was across the hearth from me. He looked about the room and at the curtain windows that shut out the blue night. You can't sleep, he went on, so I might just as well tell you this. A good deal of it is what the lawyers call dicta, abator dicta, when the judge gets to putting in stuff on the side. But it's a long time till daylight. He had taken a small chair, and he sat straight in it after the manner of a big man. You see, the treasure carried south across the Shamo would be gold wheat, dust you'd call it, packed in green skins. You couldn't find that. But the caravans crossing the El Kali would carry this gold in bricks for the Great West trade. Now a gold brick is indestructible. You can't think of anything that would last forever like a gold brick. Nothing would disturb it. Water and sun are alike without effect on it. That was Tavor's notion. And he went right after it. Most of us would have slacked out after two years in the hellhole of central Mongolia, but not Charlie Tavor. He got down to Arabia somehow, God knows I never asked him, and he went right on into the great sandy desert of Roba el Kali. The oldest caravan route known runs straight across the desert from Muscat to Mecca. It's a thousand miles across, but you can strike the line of it nearly 400 miles west in a hundred miles travel by going due south from the coast between 50 and 55 degrees. You'll find this old caravan route drawn on the map a dead straight line across the 33rd parallel. But the man that put it on there never traveled over it. He doesn't know whether it is a sunken plateau or an elevated plateau or what the devil it is that this old route runs across, and he doesn't know what the earth's like in the great basin of the El Kali. Maybe it's sand, and maybe it's something else. Barclay stopped and looked queerly at me. The Dr. Cooks have put a lot of stuff over us. The fact is, there's six million square miles of the Earth's surface that nobody knows anything about. He got a package of American cigarettes out of his pocket, selected one, and lighted it with a fragment of the box thrust into the fire. That's where Tavor was the last year. When the ambulance picked him up, he crawled around the horn in a Siamese tramp. He paused. Great people, the English. No fag out to them. Look how Scott went on to the Antarctic with his feet frozen. It's in the blood. It was in Tavor. I sat there that winter night in my room in New York while he told me all about it. It was morning when he finished. The milk wagons were on the street. And then he had it quite simply as though it were a matter of no importance. But I can't go back, Barkley, old man. My tramping's over. That was no fit I had on the dock. He looked at me with his dead eyes and his tan-colored plaster face. You've heard of the hemp chewers and the betel chewers? Well, all that's baby food to a thing they've got in the shamo. It's a shredded root, bitter like cactus, and when you chew it, you don't get tired and you don't get hot. You go on, and you don't know what the temperature is. Then some day, all at once, you go down, cold all over like a dead man. That time you don't die, but the next time... Barclay snapped his fingers without adding the word. And you calculate when the second one will strike you. It's 181 days to the hour. Then he added, That was the first one on the dock. Tavor had six months to live. The big man broke the cigarette in his fingers and threw the pieces into the fire. 
Then he turned abruptly toward me. And I know where he wanted to live for those six months. The old dream was still with him. He wanted that country house in his native county in England, with a formal garden in the lackeys. The finish didn't bother him, and he wanted to round out his life with the dream that he had carried about with him. I put him to bed and went down into Broadway and walked about all that night. Tabar couldn't go back, and he had to have a bunch of money. It was no good. I couldn't see it. I went back. Tavor was up, and I sat him down to a cross-examination that would have delighted the soul of a Philadelphia lawyer. Barclay paused. It was all at once that I saw it, like you'd snap your fingers. It was an accident of Charlie's talk, one of those obiter dicta that I mentioned a while ago. But I stopped Charlie and went over to the Metropolitan Library. There I got me an expert, an astronomer chap, as it happened, reading calculus in French for fun. I gave him a twenty, and I looked him in the eye. Now, Professor, I said, this dope's got to be straight stuff. I'm risking money on it. Every word you write has to be the truth, and every line and figure that you put on your map has got to be correct with a capital K. Surely, he said, I shall follow Huxley for the text, and I shall check the chart calculations for error. And there's another thing, Professor. You've got to go dumb on this job, for which I double the twenty. He looked at me, puzzled, but when he finally understood me, he said, Surely, again, and I went back to my apartment. Charlie, I said, how much money would it take for this English country life business? His eyes lighted up a little. Well, Barkley, old man, he replied, I've estimated pretty carefully a number of times. I could take Eldon's place for six months with a right to purchase for $2,000 paid down, and I could manage the servants and the living expenses for another 4000 I fear I should not be able to get on with a less sum than $6,000. Then he added, he was a child to the last, perhaps Mr. Hardman will now be able to advance it. He promised me a further percent. Those were his words when the matter was finally concluded. Then 10000 would do. My word, he said, I should go it like a lord on 10000 do you think Mr. Hartman would consider that sum? I'm going to try him, I said. I've got some influence in a quarter that he depends on. And I went out. I went down to my bank and got twenty U.S. bonds of a thousand each. At five o'clock, the professor had his dope ready, the text and the chart, neatly folded in a big manila envelope with a rubber band around it. And that evening, I went up to see old Newt. Barclay got another cigarette. There was a queer cynicism in his big pitted face. The church bunch, he said, have got a strange conception of the devil. They think he's always ready to lie down on his friends. That's a fool notion. The devil couldn't do business if he didn't come across when he needed him. And there's another thing. The old-timers, when they went after their god for a favor, always began by reciting what they'd done for him. That was sound dope. I tried it myself on the way up to old Newt's apartment on Fifth Avenue. I went over a lot of things. And whenever I made a point, I wrapped it on the pavement with the ferrule of my walking stick. As one would say, you owe me for that. You see, I was worked up about Tavor. When a man's carried a dream over all the hell he'd pushed through, he ought to have it in the end. Barclay paused and flicked the ashes from his cigarette. You know the swell apartments on Fifth Avenue? No name, only a number, every floor a residence, only the elevators connecting them. I found Old Newt in the seventh and I was bucked the moment I got in. The door from the drawing room to the library was open. The Harvard Don was going out, the one Newt had employed to get up his thesis for the Royal Society of London. I mentioned him a while ago, and I heard his final remark flung back at the door. What you require, sir, is the example case of some new exploration, one that you have yourself conducted. That bucked me. The devil was on the job. Barclay stopped again. He sat for a moment, watching the smoke from the cigarette climb in a blue mist slowly into the beautiful fresco of the ceiling. I told old Newt precisely what I've told you, how I backed Tavor for his last adventure, and where he'd been, all over central Mongolia, and finally across the great sandy desert of El Kali, and I told him what Charlie was after, the theory he started with, and his final conclusion when he made his last push along the old caravan route west from Muscat. I went into the details and the big notion that Tavar had slowly pieced together, how the gold was mined in the ranges south of Siberia, 
carried in green skins to lower mongolia melted there and taken for trade southwest across the el kali to an immense babylon of commerce of which the present mecca is perhaps a decadent residue i put it all in the accessibility of this desert from the coast on three sides how the old caravan route parallels the thirty-third meridian and how charlie struck it four hundred miles out into the desert in a hundred miles travel due south in longitude between fifty and fifty-five degrees all the details of tavor's hunt for the wreck of one of these treasure caravans old newt looked at me with his little hard eyes slipping about and he didn't find it he said i didn't answer that i went ahead and told him how i found tavor and the shape he was in and then i added i'm not an explorer and charlie can't go back old newt's thick neck shot out at that and he did find it he said now look here newt i said you're not trading with tavor in this deal you're trading with me and i'm just as slick as you are you'll get no chance to slip under on this you forget all i've told you just as though it had nothing to do with what i'm going to tell you and i'll come to the point forget it he said yes i said forget it i'm not going to put you on to what charlie knows with any strings to it or with any pointers that you can run down without us i've told you all about tavor's big hunt through the shamo and the el kali for a purpose of my own and not for the purpose of enabling you to locate the thing that charlie tavor knows about hardman's voice went down into a low note what does he know he said i looked him squarely in the little reptilian eyes he knows where there is a treasure in gold equal in our money to three hundred thousand dollars Old Newt's little eyes focused into his nose an instant. Then he took a chance at me. What's the country like? I went on as though I didn't see the drift. Tavor says this area of the Earth's surface is a great plain practically level, sloping gradually on one side and rising gradually on the other. Sand, said Newt. No, I replied. Tavor says the contrary to the common notion. This plain is not covered with sand. It's a kind of chalk deposit. Hard to get to? Old Newt shot the query in with a little quick duck of his head. I went straight on with the answer. Tavar says it's about a five or six days' journey from a seacoast town. Hard traveling? No, Tavar says you can get within two miles of the place without any difficulty whatever. He says anybody could do it. The only difficulties are on the last two miles, but up to the last two miles it's a holiday journey for a middle-aged woman. Old Newt grunted. He put his fat hands together over his waistcoat and twiddled his thumbs. Well, he said, what's in your mind about it? We were now up to the trade, and I stayed at the terms. It's like this, I said. Tavor's down and out. He's got only six months to live. Fifth Avenue, piled full of gold, won't do any good if he's got to wait for it. What he wants is a little money quick. Old Newt's eyes squinted. How much money, he said. Well, I said. Tavor will turn his map over to you for ten thousand dollars. Death's crowding him. Old Newt's fat fingers began to drum on his waistcoat. How do I know the gold's there and the map's straight? Did you ever know Tavor to lie, I said. No, he said. Tavor's not a liar, but I am a businessman, Mr. Barclay, and in business we do not go on verbal assurances, no matter how unquestioned. That's right, I replied. I'm a businessman, too. That's why I came instead of sending Tavor. You found out he wasn't a businessman in the first deal. Then I took my shooting irons out of my pocket and laid them on the table. There, I said, are twenty one thousand United States bonds, not registered. And I put my hand on one of the big manila envelopes. And here, I said, is an accurate description of the place where this treasure lies and a map of the route to it. And I put my hand on the other. Now, I went on. I believe every word of this thing. Charles Tavor is the best all-round explorer in the world. I've known him a lifetime, and what he says goes with me. We'll put up this bunch of stuff with a stakeholder for the term of a year, and if the gold isn't there, and if the map showing the route to it isn't correct, and if every word I've said about it isn't precisely the truth, you'd take down my bonds and keep them. Old Newt got up and walked about the room. I knew what he was thinking. Here's another one of them. There's all kinds. But it hooked him. We wrote out the terms and put the stuff up with old Commodore Harris, the straightest sport in America. Newt had the right to copy the map and the text in a year to verify it, 
and I took the 10000 back to Charlie Tavor. Barclay got up and went over to the window. He drew back the heavy tapestry curtains. It was morning. The blue dawn was beginning to illumine Monaco and the polished arc of the sea. He stood looking down into it, holding the curtain in his hand. I give the devil his due for that, Sir Henry, he said. Charlie Tavor got his dream at the end. He died like a gentleman in his English country house with a formal garden and the lackeys. And the other man got the treasure, I said. Barclay replied without moving. No, he didn't get it. Then you lost your bonds. No, I didn't lose them. Commodore Harris handed them back to me on the last day of the year. I sat up in my big lounge chair. Didn't Hardman make a fight for them? If he didn't find the treasure, didn't he squeal? Barclay turned about, drawing the curtain close behind him. And be laughed out of the highbrow bunch that he was trying to get into? I said old Newt was a crook, but I didn't say he was a fool. I turned around in the chair. I don't understand this thing, Barclay. The treasure was there, and you gave Hardman a correct map of the route to it, and it lay on a practically level plain and he could get within two miles of it without difficulty in four or five days' travel from a seacoast town. Why didn't he get it? Was it all the truth? It was every word precisely the truth, he said. Then why couldn't he get it? Barclay looked down at me. His big, pitted face was illumined with a cynical smile. Well, Sir Henry, he said, the trouble is with those last two miles. They're water, straight down. The level plain is the bed of the Atlantic Ocean and that gold is in the hold of the Titanic. End of the last adventure.